All right, so we are again in the book of First Corinthians. Uh, we uh, talked last week about what? First Corinthians 5. Thank you so much. At least he knows I go in order. So last week was about dealing with sin inside of the body of Christ. Uh, the title for my message this week is What Really Matters? Uh, my original title was First Century Court TV. Um, but that didn't really get to the point that I, that I thought God was leading me to. Um, I will share uh, a little bit behind the curtain. I have, um, I, 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 okay, we'll just do this and let it land where it goes. I, I spent almost 26 hours this week working on this message. And yet yesterday morning, as I was trying to get it into a form, to share, I was really, really struggling um, to get it in a, a form that I thought made sense. Um, I, I think this was just kind of like chapter five would be a great discussion chapter to kind of work our way through. So again, just like last week, you're going to get to see a little glimpse into my mind. Uh, Dan did say something. What'd you say I had? Common? No, you didn't say common sense. What'd you say I had? He doesn't even remember. Wow, we're Dan and I are really good shape. Uh, anyway, so um, but so let's go ahead and get started. If you could and are able and willing, will you please stand for the reading of God's word? You're reading First Corinthians uh, chapter six, verses one through eleven out of the ESV. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. And to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Dear Heavenly Father, we, I come before you this morning, and, and Father, I humbly beseech you that by the power of the Holy Spirit that the truth that you want shared with your people will go forth. That what it is you want us to learn, what you want us to implement in our lives, in, our, in this local body of church, wherever you put, put us, that it will not be lost on us. It may be true, Lord, that perhaps we're not in this exact same situation at this exact moment, but Father, your word instructs us, for one day we may indeed have this set before us. And we want to respond according to your revealed word. We do not want to respond in accordance with the wisdom of men, but with your unfailing wisdom. Lord, this morning I want to pray for the leaders of our country regardless of the party that they are in, Lord, I would ask that you would draw them to Jesus. Lord Jesus, that, that your Father would give them to you, that the Holy Spirit would do what only he can do in their lives. 
that we would see a revival of those who lead us, not simply a profession, but an actual transformation, a removing of hearts of stone, a removing of fine words and lofty human wisdom and being given hearts of flesh and the mind of Christ. Lord, we just lift them up to you. Lord, we also ask that you would help them as they govern. Lord, for them to remember um, who put them there. And for those who do not know you, they may think they did it of their own just incredible skill or by the expenditure of large sums of money. But Lord, we know that they are only there because you have placed them there. Lord, I ask for your children. Lord, I, I, I don't pretend to know all that is going on in this body of believers. There may be great sins that are occurring that I am unaware of. There may be conflicts of which I do not know. I pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts, that we would see from just looking at your word today that we are one in Christ. The preciousness, the beauty, and the sacredness of that. Lord, that um, give me wisdom, hide me behind your cross. And Lord, if I say it wrong, Holy Spirit, would you just intercept the words and make it right? It's all in your glory, for your glory and in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I probably should have reached out to Daniel Flanagan to, to, to do this since it has to do with law. And I, I've heard, or I know that he knows some amount of law. But so I want to first kind of get us started with some maybe helpful or background information. It, it really is quite fascinating, the Roman legal system. A lot of what we have today has its basis in what the Romans did. If you had a dispute with somebody and couldn't resolve it, uh, you would go somewhere and they would assign you two arbiters and a third arbiter that would be neutral, and then you could resolve it that way. If that didn't work, then they would assign a, a, a court of 40 who would then hear your arguments. And then if that didn't resolve the argument or resolve the issue, they would put you in front of a court that could have up to a couple thousand jurors who, could you imagine that, a jury of like 3,000 people trying to come to a conclusion? That would be, uh, anyway. Um, so, but they had this system where you were going to be judged by your peers, by other people. If you were 60 years old, you were going to be an arbitrator at some point. If you were 30 or older, you were going to serve in a jury. That's how it worked. And so in a sense, we have that in commonality with the Roman legal system. However, hopefully, this is something we don't have in common with it, but I think sadly, we maybe have more in common with it than I would care to believe or admit. In Campus and Rossner's commentary on 1 Corinthians, it says the ancient Roman courts could not be relied upon to administer justice impartially since they were open to bribes and were partial to the status and power of the prosecutor or defendant or both. The Roman judicial system was damaged by improper influences that made equality before the law unattainable. In fact, the principal criterion of legal privilege in the eyes of the Romans was dignitas or honor derived from power style of life, and wealth. And we can see a little glimpse of this even in the life of Paul when he was before, I think, Felix. And Paul was going on and on about the, the joy that he had in Christ and of all these different things. And, and Felix cut him short and sent him away. But in verses 24 through 26, in part, it says, um, Felix says to Paul, so when I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul, so he sent for him often. In the Roman system, it really was those who had the most money typically prevailed. 
not because they could hire the better attorney, but they could give the bigger bribe. When you think about this in James, in the book of James, James warns the people about rich people, says that the rich people are the ones who drag you into court. And they would typically win. It's really kind of fascinating. I think the Romans at their heart struggle to find a way to make equality before the law work. But the reality is, is that they couldn't do it because they were greedy. Somebody could come along, and, and, and I, I just didn't start Roman times, but it's that idea of everybody has their price. And it just depended on how much you needed to give the arbiters in order to get the ruling that you wanted. Something that was also unique in the, in the world of Corinth and the Roman thing was that legal disputes were aired in large public buildings, which were part of the city's forum. When the court met, the public gathered around to take in the spectacle of well-known townsfolk accusing each other of all kinds of wrongdoing before the court, while a leading citizen who served as judge made his ruling. Think first century Judge Judy or Judge Wapner. People would go and watch these people duke it out so that the person behind the, the bench could come out and give some type of incredible uh, um, ruling on what was presented before them. And so with a little bit of that background, and we'll come back to that in a couple of points, because I just think it's, it's something we really need to think about. I think it's so easy for us to take our modern culture and place it upon something like Rome or Greece and say that, oh, that must have been how they were, but that is not how they were. Imagine, would, would you enjoy going to court if really what mattered is how much money you could give the judge? You could hire me as an attorney and win if you had enough money. Think about that for a moment. Anyway, so, so in this, Paul comes, and, and I, I really, I want to, I want to say this, sort of, I do not believe that Paul is talking about sin issues. And why do I say that? Because in chapter 5, he dealt with things that were a sin. Things that were contrary to God's law were handled like they were in chapter 5. Here, it's possible that we're dealing with contractual disputes, more civil. It's also not dealing with criminal issues, because that probably would fall into the idea of sin. But as I, was, I tried really hard to find what types of cases there were, and nobody would even guess, which is very discouraging. I'm like, really? Could you just not make one up? And so I did. Um, so I was thinking, I asked Dan to paint my house. Dan says, oh, I'll paint your house. He comes, and he does a horrible job. Dan and Joe get in an argument because I paid Dan 50 bucks to paint my house. Yeah, it was cheap. That's probably why it didn't look good. So we would go back and forth in Roman time until we ended up in court. And because Dan has more money than me, I don't know, pastor, teacher, that might be close. Anyway, um, the, the one of us with the most money would end up winning the trial. So it's, it, it wasn't the idea that it was a sinful thing. It was just something that these people had, had issues with that they could not get resolved. And so what were some of these troubles, perhaps? Well, for me, the first thing that's obvious is that it was about conflicts. Let's face it, it's nothing new in the church in Corinth that they had conflicts. Paul was not surprised that they had conflicts. In 111, it says, for it's been reported by, to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling, this idea of, of a vociferous disagreement. In verse uh, 3 of chapter 3, it's the same word. It says um, that there is strife among you, this idea that they are just really knocking heads. And in my mind, it's almost like this natural progression. It wasn't something that was criminal, but it was something that somebody was like, I am going to win. And so they got to a point, and they have this thing, and they think it's a grievance. And most of us know, even in our world, as back then, you could sue anybody for practically anything. And so they would. And so Paul's looking at them, and he's like, man, you have these conflicts. Why are you having these conflicts? And the reality is Paul's not surprised that they have conflicts. What he's surprised by is how they are resolving them. 
So the first thing is there is they have these huge conflicts. And in my mind, the next issue is that those who have more money are leveraging their advantage over those who do not have as much money. In 1, 4, and 6, it says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have standing, no standing in the church? But brother goes to law against brother, then, and that before unbelievers. Why would they do that? Because they think they have a distinct advantage. If they get in court, they can either out-talk them or they can outspend them. Now think about what this is for people who do not have a lot of money. In the church in Corinth and throughout the first century church, there were a lot of people that God brought into the family of God who did not have very many resources. Indeed, there were many that were slaves. Again, in their their commentary on 1 Corinthians, uh, Camp and Rosner write this, the system favored people of higher status. Cicero complained that excessive, excessive favor Great resources and money with which to offer bribes hindered justice in the provinces east of Rome. Although Roman jurors strove to formulate a definition of justice that would be valid for all times and all peoples, in practice, the Roman legal system, which was controlled, of course, by the upper class, reinforced the distinctions between the classes in Roman society. The modern notion of equal standing in the law did not pertain. And so this is why those inside the church would end up going to law because they wanted to win. It was important to win. It was important to enforce their will upon those around them. And so these are the two problems. But, but the struggle I think Paul also has is that when they're going before unbelievers, what they're ending up doing is they're reinforcing to a watching world that there is no difference between believers and unbelievers. We behave just like they do. When we have an issue, we get an attorney. When we have a problem with somebody and we don't think we can win, we'll get an attorney and we'll sue them. I've seen it throughout the years. Maybe you've seen it where somebody applies for membership to a church and they're turned down, so they get an attorney and sue the church. I remember reading years ago about somebody that the church did church discipline on them, and so they did the really righteous thing is they got an attorney to sue the church for breach of contract. Now, I know that we would all hope that some attorney would look at that and go, no, I am not going to prosecute that case. But what do we see in our country? Really, almost anything, things that just blow my mind, end up in civil court. And you just figure out how to keep doing it and doing it until it just sticks. And a lot of times in our country, you're doing it just to shame the other person so they don't want to get in court and get a bad reputation, so they'll pay you before they get there. And in my mind, I think Paul's heart is so hurt because these people that are believers or followers of Jesus Christ are showing to the world they're just like everyone else. Now, remember Paul's upbringing. Paul was what? Pharisee? Okay, First, he was Jewish. We'll start there. He was Pharisee, Roman citizen. He, he was very knowledgeable. You know, when we look at what he talks about, okay, this thing. So for him, and this, I find this, I'm not going to read this, but I'll let you look at it, because I found this very interesting, is that the Jews, the nation of Israel, even when they were under captivity, would rarely ever go to court before pagans. And it's interesting, part of the reason they wouldn't do it is they felt like if by doing that, they were basically saying that God's methods didn't work. Think about this last line from John MacArthur. It was considered a form of blasphemy to go to court before Gentiles. You, is the Jews, that's just not something they did. The only time they infamously did is that they did for Jesus. And that's because the Roman government would not allow them to pronounce the sentence of death. But Paul wanted the church at Corinth to be different. We want to be different. Another problem is it's just, it's just wrong. 
1 Corinthians 6, 8, but you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Think about this. They treat them unjustly. They deprive their brothers in the Lord, their brothers and sisters in the Lord by deceit. They are using the legal system to punish their brothers and sisters in the Lord. And when I was reading this, it just made me think immediately of the book of Micah, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. It says, Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it, because it is in the power of their hand. And this idea in Micah, when we were studying it, is that they were using legal means to win cases. It says, They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them away. They oppress a man in his house and a man in his inheritance. In Micah, Jewish leaders were using perfectly legal mechanisms in order to cheat the federal, the fellow, their fellow Israelites. And so in Corinth, the believers, most of them probably wealthy, were using the legal system in order to, to win. Again, William Baker says this of the court system back then. It says, a lopsided advantage people of means had over others in civil court system should also now be recognized as an obvious affront to God's concern for fairness towards the poor. Likely, the wealthier believers among the Corinthians were using the Roman judicial system to their advantage against the poor, like others of their social class did routinely in Roman society. And, and, and perhaps in this exact moment, we, we don't, aren't dealing with two people that have a conflict that, that's going to somehow end up in court, but God is sharing this with us because it does happen. People have disagreements with each other, and hopefully as we go through, we'll be able to figure out the right way to resolve these, these conflicts. The last thing of the, of the problems is, is that Paul says it's already a defeat. The fact that you have lawsuits, and this does really have the idea of taking someone to court, the idea of taking them before a judge and a jury to get your way. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. And why was it such a defeat? They were one body. When Baker says, how can one part litigate litigate against another part without damaging the whole. They were self-centered. They were selfish. And dare I say, we are the same way. Maybe we're not in court, but sometimes we can be characterized by being self-centered and selfish. So how do we get around this? How do we, how do we deal when there are issues among us? Well, I think the first thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that we have the right attitude. I'm going to start in Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 4. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And if we think about it, a lot of times people will quote this passage from Philippians, and an awful lot of believers are like, yeah, that's right. Same love, same mind. I need to think about others first. I need to put their needs ahead of mine. I need to carry their burdens. But in, Cor in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul lays something that I will confess to you is incredibly difficult about having this right attitude. Because that idea of considering others better than yourself, looking to the needs of others, leads Paul to write this to the church at Corinth. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded. I would submit to us that in the Western culture we live in, 
that statement is anathema. This morning in Sunday school, the incredible, wonderful time that we have in Sunday school from 9.30 to 10.30 with self-dispensed coffee, or no, Tom dispensed coffee. I would encourage you to come out. We're looking at sovereignty of God. Uh, somebody had said that, you know, uh, about obeying their father when it seemed reasonable. And that's a lot of times what we do. We read Philippians chapter 2, and we're like, yeah. You know, although sometimes we're turning it around like, yeah, you really need to look out for my needs. You need to consider me better than yourself. You need to carry my burden. You know, and we're like, it's all happy kumbaya when nothing is really going on. But you add into that mix a time when you might be right, but Paul, God through Paul writes to you, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? For the sake of the body of Christ, do you have to win? Do you have to prove your point? Maybe you are right, but as a wealthy person, you could afford to be out the money. Now, I want to be careful here because Paul, definitely in this context, writing about dispute between those inside the church. This is not a, a universal civil law thing that if your neighbor sues you, that you go like, well, judge, I know he wants to take my house. Uh, I, I'd rather be wronged. I don't think that that's what Paul's trying to say. Because we'll look, at, we'll look here. It says, Paul talks about these things being normal matter of life. Going back to the example with Dan and I, really and truthfully, is it the end of the world if the paint job isn't the best in the world? No. Especially for me, I probably wouldn't notice. My wife, on the other hand, might be a little less happy than me. And Paul calls these things trivial things. These things that, that, that the idea of trivial means these things are the least. And yet in the Western world, we're great at making mountains out of molehills. So we need to make sure that we have the right attitude. You know, what, what does it profit me to win if I destroy a brother or sister in the Lord? What good is that? The other thing that helps me work through this, this correct way of, of dealing with conflict is, is having the right perspective. If I can get this switch. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that there are, we are to judge angels how much more than matters pertaining to this life? We are getting worked up on things that are temporal rather than focusing on things that are universal. Now, as I, I was studying through this, Paul knows a whole lot more about what's happening at the end of the age than he ever wrote. It would have been nice if he would have wrote instead of just like, oh, you know what I taught you when he talked to the Thessalonians. Remember how I said that this would be okay, and then you get the idea he taught all this stuff. I'm like, really, Paul? Could you just not just write it again for my benefit? But Paul is trying to say is, this, you know, we have this idea, maybe he's referring back to Matthew, where Jesus told the, the apostles that they would sit on 12 thrones judging the, the nation of Israel. Maybe he's talking about the millennial kingdom, where it talks about those who come into that will rule with him. I couldn't really find an exact great place or a verse that said that we would actually judge angels. Uh, uh, but some people have said that this has the idea of rule over angels. The idea that Christ was raised far above the angels, since we are co-heirs with Christ, we are raised far above the angels, and so in that end time, we will govern over angels. And I, and I think that's a great thing that we can have coffee over and talk about, but I, I think in this thing, what Paul's trying to say is, you need to have the right perspective about what's going on in your midst. What, what, why are you not thinking that somebody in your flock can't give you some type of wisdom in this matter? He said, you need to have the right perspective. This thing that you are going to law over before unbelievers is a trivial, everyday thing that we can handle in-house. 
You know, I used to really think that it said, this is way simplification of it, that, that it said is that any moron in the body could, could give you a judge judgment on this. But it's not really what it says. I don't know where I got that idea. But it does say, you know, is it... Um, do, 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 do. So do you not know what judge said? So if you have cases, why do you lay them before those you know, standing church? I say to shame, can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between brothers? God's very, word is very clear. He has given us everything we need in this body of believers for everything that we need to deal with. If there is some type of conflict between Dan and I or Jim and I, one of you is more than wise enough to provide an answer for us. But what informs my attitude and my perspective? I, I dare say, if I'm honest with myself, a lot of what informs my attitude and my perspective is my culture. I, I don't want to be wronged. I shouldn't have to be wronged. I have a right to defend myself. I have God-given inalienable rights. But the reality is, is that my attitude and my perspective about the disputes of this world need to be informed, need to be formed, need to be instructed, need to be conformed to God's revealed word. And it's, at first, as, as I was studying through this, and I was really working through this, I was really confused by 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11a, where it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, or drunkards, or revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God, and such were some of you. I was trying to think, what does that got to do, Paul, with judging these conflicts between believers? And then it kind of struck me, and maybe it's, maybe it's just a Joe thing in my brain, and my two-little-cylinder brain came up with this, but the reality is, is I am not who I used to be. I am not driven by worldly passions. I am not driven by my own self-interest. I am not driven by all that this world says is important. I am no longer who I used to be. I am a new creation. And that idea of being a new creation needs to infect every single part of my life. The other thing is whose I am and who I am. 11b, 611b says, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I am God's. I am co-heirs with Jesus Christ. I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I am sealed for the day of redemption by him. I am cannot any longer be controlled by who I used to be. And this idea of being washed has the idea of being forgiven, that my sins have been forgiven. When Jesus said upon the cross, it is finished, it was indeed finished, he paid my complete debt. To be sanctified, to become as dedicated to God to be justified, to become judicially vindicated, to be declared righteous. This is a done deal. There are no go-backs. There is no re, re, um, rebooting the system and God saying, well, no, you've gone too far. Now you're no longer washed. You're no longer sanctified. You're no longer justified. You have to start over. These are things that I am. I am forgiven. I am his, and I am declared righteous. If you know me very well, you'll know that I am not a huge fan of grammar. And those who really know me might think that grammar made me cry when I was in ninth grade and I got a D. My mom made me cry for getting that D. 
The grammar didn't. <laughs> it, it made no sense to me. But I'll be really honest. I'm going to share something. Just it, it, They're not tears of sadness. God uses words in such a way. I was so glad that my wife and daughter were gone because I was crying at my table as I looked at this. All three of these words, washed, sanctified, justified, are in the aorist tense. I highlight the reason. It means it's completed and decisive. It's done. Even if I screw up royally, it doesn't change it. And then the indicative. It's an insertion that it is real. So we take these things together, and I am really, completely, decisively forgiven, sanctified, and justified. And listen, if that doesn't give you tears of joy, as you realize, as I realized yesterday, I'm a horrible sinner. And yet my Savior died for me that I could be forgiven, that I could be sanctified and justified forever. And listen, I, we take a look at this. How can this truth not impact my attitude? How can this truth not impact my perspective? How can it not impact my relationship with brothers and sisters in the Lord? How can it not impact the way that I resolve my conflicts? How can it not make me look differently at my rights? The reality is, how can it do anything but impact absolutely everything in my world? Listen, I almost feel, and I don't know if I have to ask Paul, although it'll be a long time before I get around to thinking it's important to ask Paul when I get there. Um, is it this idea that because these, not because that these are true of me, it's okay if I'm wronged. It is perfectly fine if I'm defrauded. You know why? Because I'm forgiven. I'm sanctified. I'm justified. I'm going to spend eternity with God in glory. So are my brothers and sisters. And so who cares who wins a battle on the earth? And just the last thing for me is, as I thought through this, and I rewrote it several times, but just came to this and says, would I rather God be glorified, the gospel of Jesus Christ shown to be true and more important than the things of this world, or claim victory in matters pertaining to this temporal world? Listen, so much of what I get worked up about in eternity is going to be meaningless. All of it's going to be meaningless. And so I could have hurt a brother or sister in the Lord for something that doesn't matter. And, and just as I sat there, probably two or three o'clock by the time I got done, I was looking at this screen. I was just going like, man, thank you, God, that it really doesn't matter what happens here in a, in a sense of these legal conflicts that we're having. We need to be about sharing the gospel. We need to be discipling our kids. We need to be discipling people around us. I'm not talking about, I'm just talking about some of the things that we get worked up over, some of the things that I get worked up over in the scheme of eternity are going to fade to nothing. And that's the most important thing. And so I was trying to think, you know, how, does, how do I take this and how does this work? How do, how do I make this real life? And uh, I, I told you a couple weeks ago, I found a flowchart function in PowerPoint. So you know where I'm going. Uh, well, maybe, maybe, I think I'm going. So Matthew 18, in my estimation, is about leading to church discipline. But I really think that we can use Matthew 18 as instructive on how we can deal with conflicts among brothers and sisters that aren't an issue of sin. Very clearly, we go privately first. We don't go find the elders. We don't go find the pastor. We don't air it on Facebook, Instagram, post-it notes, or anything else. 
And listen, if you go and you go to that person privately and it's resolved, praise the Lord. Matthew 18 says you've won a brother. Fantastic. Great. And, and guess what? Resolution doesn't mean I won. Okay? Understand that. For some of us, we'll think, yeah, Pastor Joe, I, I agree with you. When, it's, when I win, it's resolved. No? There, there are times that we, we can say, you know what? I don't mean to keep picking on Dan, but Dan and I can just look at each other and go like, you know what? Really, it doesn't matter. It's, it's really not that big a deal. And we rejoice. Or perhaps it's something that we just, we just really feel like in our hearts that, man, this isn't right. Maybe, maybe I, I blew Jim off because I just like, you know, whatever. Well, then I take one or two people with me. They come and they listen to both sides. And I almost feel like this is not exactly Scripture, but I almost feel like we need to not prime the pump before we get together with them. Because what was the Scripture talk about? Whoever talks last is the one that it seems right. That's a total brutalization of the Scripture, sorry. But the whole idea that whoever gives the last argument, you're like, oh, you know, I go first. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, he's right. Then Jim goes like, oh, wow, yeah, no, Jim's right, you know. But it's, we, we take one or two people. If it's resolved, we rejoice. Again, it doesn't matter who wins. If it's still unresolved, we find a wise person, wise brother in the church, dried herd. And guess what? The, the, the bottom part of unresolved and weep, I, I think, would be very sad. But here's the reality is, I think when you get to the church, both parties have to say, win or lose, it ends here. When this person gives us an answer, Jim, you and I, Dan, you and I, we will submit to what they think is best. You know, it not uh, every time I, I, I've thought about this, I keep thinking of a, of a Solomon and the baby that he was going to cut in two. It's like, don't do that. Don't, don't come. Don't ask us to do it. But we need to come when we get to that stage. It really should never go to the unresolved part. So I think then you end up with church discipline because somebody's in sin at that point. But I really think if you get to that point that the party's involved and you say, you know, Lord, Lord, whatever, we're going to trust you. Whatever this person tells us, we're going to abide by it. We're going to submit to it. And I, and I really think for us as believers, for, for me, for me, I really need to focus on what really matters. And it's not my rights. It's, I've been, I've been trained to win. It's, yeah, I've been trained to get the W, right? That's how we all get trained in our culture. But we need to look at this instructive from Paul and say, you know what? For the unity of the body, for the glory of God, for the, for the propagation of the gospel, I'm willing to lose. Now this morning, if you are here separated from Christ, this makes absolutely no sense to you. I would beg you to come to Christ, to cry out to him that he would, that he would draw you to himself, that you would be able to be saved, to be counted among those who will spend eternity with him. But I'm also not a fool. It's very possible that there are believers who hear this and go, that's just not right. I would ask you to study it out for yourself and see if this is what God's word says or not. You know, I've said this before. The old saying is, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That is wrong. God said it, that settles it. The end question is, are I willing to submit to it? My submitting to it doesn't make it right, doesn't make it wrong. God said as we do it, and you, you may disagree with me. I'm, I'm more than welcome to disagree with me, but study it out for yourself then and see what God, through his writer, through his apostle Paul, is saying to the church about how to deal with conflicts. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. 
Lord, I, I thank you that, it seems like I hear so often, Father, people say the Bible just doesn't deal with everything, but wow, it just it seems like this covers an awful lot of ground. And Father, I, I ask for your forgiveness if in the past I was more concerned with winning than with your glory and your honor and your fame. Lord, may we be seen as a body of believers who are different. That the world sees us and goes, man, I, I don't know why, but they're just not like everybody else. And Father, I do pray that if anybody is, is hearing this and they don't know you, Lord, Father, please draw them to yourself. Draw them to your Son. By the power of the Holy Spirit, add them to the family. And for those of us who are your children, Lord, may we take these words to heart. May they not simply be words on a page which, we are, which are forgotten before we get past the entrance. But it's something that when... It comes in our lives that we will remember this. And by your grace, your mercy, and your power, we will put it into action. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. Thank you for your sacrifice. I look forward, Jesus, to when I will see you face to face. And I ask, Father, that it may be soon. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. He is risen. Go forth and have a fantastic...